Tonight we will be discussing uh, the challenges, the opportunities, the proposal, and uh, the funding and future for mass transit. And of course, as probably many of you know, there's a proposal on the table uh, to be voted on next month. We have two guests joining us tonight, Debbie Ruggles, Assistant General Manager of Tulsa Transit, and James Wagner, Principal Transportation Planner for, Planner for Indian Nations Council of Governments. Uh, thank you for being here. Please give them a hand. Before we dive into questions, I'll just quickly explain the format. It's pretty simple. I'll spend the first 15 minutes or so asking questions of the guests, and then uh, we'll invite the audience to ask questions as well. We have a couple of Oklahoma Watch staff members or interns uh, available with microphones. Evie Holzer here to the right, and Victor Henderson standing by the door to the left. Uh, we only ask you to keep your uh, questions and comments relatively brief so we get a, can get in as many questions as possible over the next hour. Um, I also would like to express our thanks to uh, first the Kirkpatrick Foundation, which has provided us a grant specifically to cover some of the costs of offering our public forums, which we try to do on a monthly basis and our primary funders, the George Kaiser Family Foundation and the Ethics and Excellence in Journalism Foundation, among our uh, other uh, funders. With that, I guess we'll get started. And so I would first like to turn to Ms. Ruggles and ask, I guess, a fairly simple question. There's a proposal for Tulsa voters in April. Please tell me why we should vote for that proposal. Well, there's many exciting projects in the vision proposal for public transportation. First of all, I want to say that this would be the first time in our history as an organization, and we've been an organization since 1968, that we would have a dedicated permanent tax for public transportation. So that's an exciting thing for us. In terms of the projects, we think that the projects themselves really are transformational in terms of moving us along the continuum of where public transportation needs to go in our community. Um, there's a couple of bus rapid transit projects uh, we have in the Vision Project. We got funding for the Peoria Bus Rapid Transit Project in the Improve Our Tulsa uh, package, but we did not get the operating funds. So. This will put the operating funds, we'll be able to operate what we're going to build. And then we also got funding for the um, Route 66 BRT, which will basically go, let me go back, the, the Peoria BRT goes from 38th Street North on the north and Peoria up to the um, Walmart at 81st and Lewis. The Route 66 route would go from downtown out 11th Street uh, covering many, many destinations, including obviously uh, TCC and the University of Tulsa, uh, out to Garnett, up, 20, up to 21st Street on Garnett, out to Eastgate Metroplex. Um, there's a couple of circulators. One is a downtown circulator that would move from being, today it is the, um, just a kind of a nighttime shuttle, but it would move to being a more daytime shuttle in the downtown area. Uh, first to move through the downtown area during the lunchtime crowd and then later to be more of an all-day shuttle to move people through the downtown area. The second shuttle is a midtown shuttle that basically covers the downtown area then takes people up to the gathering place through Brookside into um, or up to Utica Square Shopping Center, Cherry Street, Pearl District, and back downtown. Um, Finally, we will have um, Sunday service, which again is the first time we'll ever have Sunday service in this community. We're very excited about that. And that is the number one ask we get from our current customers uh, because many are transit dependent and not having Sunday service really is a problem for them in terms of getting to jobs and uh, things that they're needing to do on Sunday. And then finally, the, uh, the transit hub uh, that would be moving our current station to another location in downtown, looking at a more multimodal hub 
um, that would be adjacent to a rail line for future planning options and just an awful now that will not be built out per se but there's money in the in the vision package for a study that would decide where it needs to be what elements need to be in it uh, perhaps some land acquisition money and some money to provide some local match for federal dollars so that's kind of what's in the package mm -hmm. Oh, Mr. Wagner, let, well then let me pose the question to you. Why do you think people should favor this proposal and what are the couple of things you think they should remember most of all about it in terms of it making a difference? Well, I think, w w to me when I think about transit, um, I really think about the, um, the ability that it has to uh, give signals to the private market uh, in terms of economic development. So uh, you can look at uh, examples across the country of places where they have invested in, uh, in, in transit and the areas around the stations are typically the areas where you see the greatest amount of economic development. So there's a study that just came out actually in November uh, that looked at this issue and it looked at, um, it looked at jobs, it looked at housing, uh, and it found that uh, when there was a significant transit investment, and this is specifically for bus rapid transit, that uh, about double of the amount of jobs that you would have, ex would have expected. So they took the entire metro area and then they looked at the growth in jobs across the metro area and then they looked at it uh, for just that area that was around the transit station and there were double of the amount of jobs and the amount of housing that, uh, that came to that area as compared with the rest of the region. So it gives a signal to the private market that this is where we want development to occur. Um, so that's what happens around transit stations, typically within uh, a quarter of a mile or, or even up to half a mile around those transit stations. So one of the things, kind of going back to uh, what the city of Tulsa did about six years ago with its comprehensive plan is that it wanted to start to regain some of the share of jobs uh, and uh, population that it was losing to the suburbs. And so one of the ways to do that, obviously, is to encourage uh, infill development uh, in areas that we, that we don't have a lot of development. And so uh, I think that's one thing. The other thing it does is these, um, these focused transit corridors, the two uh, bus rapid transit lines, they enable people to uh, really be able to uh, decrease, I, I call it the minus one, uh, in terms of decreasing the amount of vehicles in their household by one. So I don't think we're to the point yet where we have uh, a really significant amount of population that can really do without a car in a household. But I do think we're getting to the point with these investments that we're getting the, that you can actually have a household that has one less car than adults. So what does that mean? Well, uh, in terms of the economic impact that it can have at the household level, uh, AAA estimates that uh, people spend about $8,000 per year on their vehicles. Uh, and so if you just look at that, if just 5% of the households in the city of Tulsa, just 5%, if they ha were able to have one fewer car, that would mean $64 million more that we would have in the economy uh, as a result of not having that car because most of the, invest most of the costs of owning a vehicle are actually leaving the local economy. They're, they're going to the auto manufacturer, the people who ma manufacture the tires and things like that, insurance insurers and things like that. So, uh, so that's significant, $64 million a year. Uh, but also, if that $8,000, even if it was saved over the course of, say, a child's lifetime, uh, it could be $150,000 that's saved in order to go to a, a child's education, for example, so your, your kid's college education. So we're talking about real money that people can actually, it can, it can really transform uh, families in terms of, even, and that's even if just a small proportion of the population does that. A, qu a question on that. Transit, in some ways, seems to be a chicken or egg proposition. Uh, there's the question, if you build transit, they will ride, some believe. Others would say, well, get more people to ride and then build or expand the system. What evidence do you have that people will give up their cars and start riding buses? Well, I think, you know, w one of the things that strate strategically that we've done with these corridors is these are already the corridors where the transit use is the highest. So. Uh, Peoria corridor already 20% of the existing transit riders are using that that one route even though there's 17 fixed routes in the entire system 17% uh, of the I mean I'm sorry 20% of the ridership is on that one one route and so um, by kind of doubling down on that you enable uh, the existing transit riders to have an increased level of service but you also enable uh, people to start making the serious decisions about where they where they locate based on 
the fact that that transit route's going to be there and it's not going away. So I think in the past, you know, we haven't had the level of service that really encourages people to uh, to really make um, location decisions as far as their residential location based on transit. But with these investments, uh, you'll, st you'll start to see people that actually say, I'm going to move to this location because I know that I can get a bus every 15 minutes, seven days a week. I think the other thing that we have seen in Tulsa is when we have made improvements in frequency, we definitely have seen improvement in ridership. Uh, way more improvement in terms of percentage ridership than even the amount of service that was added. So any incremental change in frequency makes a really good difference in ridership yield. Do you have ridership projections for once you've completed or gotten most of the way through the proposal? with the BRT lines and the, and the circulators? Do you have projections for growth in ridership? We don't have specific uh, projections at this point, but uh, we certainly know that places like uh, Kansas City, which has BRT, uh, it wasn't an immediate bump, but um, over about a 10-year period, they saw a 50% increase in ridership along the corridors in which they're doing bus rapid transit. So we know that from other cities that uh, they have been able to see significant ridership increases as a result of those investments. Uh, with any transit expansion, there is a balance question. You, on the one hand, you have to install a system that will serve businesses, promote economic development, tie into some of the destinations of the city or community. On the other hand, you also have to remember we're serving, you want to serve traditional riders of transit. They tend to be lower income. I know you've done a survey, most are white, most are women. Mm -hmm. um, so do you think that this proposal uh, achieves that balance? And I mentioned that I know you've had to scale back your original plan for increased frequency. Ms. Ruggles? We certainly did have to scale back our plan, and, and, and that's just part of the deal when you're, when you're asking for funding. Um, we, got a, we got a good package, we believe, certainly didn't get everything we had wanted to get. We had hoped to be able to increase the frequency on all of our routes um, to 30 minutes. And I, and I know there was a lot of people that still don't think 30 minutes is enough time, but, but it's significantly better than we were, where we are now in terms of we still have some routes in this community that are running at our frequency. So we still have a long way to go in that. But, you know, one of the things that I, I believe is that we have some, we have a fairly decent level of service for our transit-dependent people. And by that I mean one of the things that's very, very important for transit-dependent people is coverage, route coverage. And I always talk about there's, there's this pull and tug between coverage and frequency. The, the more coverage you get, you know, with the same amount of money, the more coverage you get, the less frequency you get, and vice versa. So I think we have very good coverage, which helps transit-dependent people because they need to get throughout the community. They need to get to lots of destinations throughout the community. So that's important to them. When you begin to look at your choice riders and try to attract those choice riders, they're not nearly as interested in coverage. They can ride a bicycle to the route, they can ride their car to a park and ride lot. Uh, they're interested in frequency. And so what I think is important about this package is that in order to move us to the next level in our transit system, we need to begin to recruit and uh, get a lot more choice riders than we have today. And with the increased frequency that you'll see on the BRT lines of 15 or 20 minutes, I think we'll begin to see those choice riders coming um, to transit. And as James was saying, you know, moving on these transit lines, uh, looking for jobs on those transit lines, really begin to see a big difference in the mix of transit dependent versus choice riders is um, one question would be fares. You have a 57, a proposal would generate $57 million over 15 years. Uh, will, but if you want to grow the system from there, how will you pay for that and will any fare increases be a part of that uh, funding? 
At this point, we don't have any plans for fare increases. Our fare is pretty comparable with most cities, in fact, maybe on the top end of a lot of communities, and so we don't feel like adding to the fare at this point is um, a good option. But, you know, one of the things that we're going to need to continue to decide as a community is, are we going to continue to fund our public transit system? I talked earlier about the exciting part about dedicated funding for the first time. I think the great thing about getting your foot in the door with a dedicated funding um, is that you always have an opportunity to grow it from there. It may not be as much as you need up front, but you have an opportunity to grow it. And I think as we demonstrate through these projects in the vision that people will begin to believe that yes, indeed, it is possible to get choice riders in our community, grow our transit system, and make a difference, and people will be more supportive of growing that tax so that we can invest further into additional frequency throughout the city. Mr. Wagner, uh, you spoke of development along the line. Mm -hmm. What can Tolson's hope to see realistically along the lines, and how long will it take? Well, you know, I think one of the, we're really at an advantageous uh, point in time in the city's uh, history. We've just updated the city's zoning code, which hadn't been updated in three decades. Uh, and so for the first time, we really have the tool necessary uh, to be able to develop the kind of uh, density that you need. So really what you need in terms of ma making transit work is you need, you need density around the stations. Uh, you need diversity in terms of what's, what destinations you can go to along that corridor. Uh, and then um, and, and if you are able to put those things together, uh, then you can have something that really works for people. So people can sometimes walk to a, to a, to a um, you know, to grocery uh, shopping or something like that. Um, but you also have the diversity of, of uh, destinations that you have along the corridor. So the zoning code allows us for the first time to be able to start uh, looking at each one of those station areas and determining uh, what's the best use, best, best and highest use for that, for that station area. Um, and the city of Tulsa is actually working now on starting to put together a land use plan for each of the station, the kind of the key station areas along the corridors. Um, and so uh, really that's the, that's the first step. Uh, but I think you can expect probably uh, a lot of mixed use, you know, that's kind of a, a maybe cliche term even now, but, uh, but you know, where you have housing above retail, um, you'll probably see um, uh, more in, more, a little bit more intense um, commercial development uh, because now you have this station area that is uh, going to have uh, pedestrians there all the time, you know, uh, around some of the stations. And we have different kind of intensity of stations. We have enhanced stations and intermediate stations and local stations. So around those larger stations, I think you'll see that kind of activity. And so, uh, and so I think that's kind of what, uh, kind of the kind of development that you'll probably expect to see. Over the you know, in a number of cities to promote transit use, uh, there has been a lot of subsidy of fares mm -hmm. by businesses and governments. Mm -hmm. City governments, state governments, county, many private employers, especially in downtown areas, will just pay 50% or 100% of the cost for their employees to mm -hmm. ride. Are you mm -hmm. seeing any signs that that's going to happen with uh, BRT lines or this expanded system should the vote pass? We have a little bit of that happening now with, uh, we do have some businesses that are supporting uh, transportation costs, public transportation costs for their employees. We think there's a much, much bigger opportunity for that as we develop BRT. Uh, the frequency increases and people are more and more interested. I, I think we'll see more of that. Um, certainly we hope that, uh, you know, one thing that will happen for sure, we believe, is uh, you know, as we get more ridership, you get a bigger share of your federal dollars. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to grow our state dollars, uh, which are pretty minimal in the state of Oklahoma. The, the dollars we get for public transit from the state are pretty small compared to what other transit systems get in other states. So you know, we're just hoping over time, it, it really is going to take a mix of funding. It's It's not it's not one thing that's going to solve the problem. It's going to be lots of things, as you suggest, that we're going to have to uh, tap into all kinds of resources to make it work. 
And already, I mean, Tulsa Transit has um, negotiated a, a deal with Tulsa Community College now where uh, all of the students, faculty, and staff at TCC, uh, just with their, with their ID, have access to the transit system, unlimited, you know, an unlimited access to that transit system. And so uh, I think you'll see, uh, you'll see probably a higher demand for what we call parking offsets, which basically is just a, um, uh, an, a way that employers, instead of providing a parking space for their, for their employees in a downtown area where it costs 65 or $85 a month to park, uh, they provide a $45 transit pass instead. Uh, and they and they provide that as a as an option to uh, to employees that don't want to that don't want to uh, drive downtown to park. Um, you, fortunately, you have some other options because now of the of the onset of Uber and Lyft and some of the right. uh, ride sharing platforms, you have the ability. Because people always say, well, what happens when my you know my kid needs to is at school and needs to go home during the middle of the day and I don't have my car? Well, now you have some options to be able to mm -hmm. uh, to have that uh, as an option. And there's even some cities that have started providing emergency ride home uh, systems so that um, if that happens at two or three times during the year, that, that cost is covered uh, to encourage the transit use. And often that's sub subsidized by the employers to encourage them to uh, utilize less, uh, less parking. So uh, the reality is parking costs a lot for employers. Uh, and it's a, uh, it's a big expense that employers, especially downtown, uh, have to uh, bear the burden of. And so uh, transit is a clearly uh, cheaper option for the employers to provide that option. I wanted to follow up on something you mentioned and ask, actually asked Mr. Wagner. You served on the task force for governance and funding, right? And I, I noticed in that report they mentioned that the American Transportation Association, if I got it right, mm -hmm. uh, estimated that you get about $3.70 in federal funding for every locally invested dollar. So does that mean we're going to get $3.70 for every one of those $57 million? Uh, well, I think that was days? actually, what that was saying is that the return on investment for a dollar invested in transit returns $3.70 to the, to the economy. So that was kind of going back to those numbers that I was kind of illustrating uh, earlier with uh, people being able to uh, either reduce their own household transportation costs or uh, the ability of employers to uh, be able to have access to a greater pool of employees, those kinds of things. So it's, there, is a, there is obviously federal dollars that are available uh, for public transportation uh, and, uh, and often those are, are competitive uh, grants uh, basically you're applying for. One of the things that this, uh, the vision uh, funding would allow us to do is start to apply for more grants. So one of the big hurdles we've had in the past for applying for uh, grants such as the Tiger program or there's a new program called Bus and Bus Facilities uh, is that uh, often the question is asked by uh, the U.S. Department of Transportation, do you have a dedicated funding source for transit? Do you know that you're going to be able to operate this if we give you the funding to, uh, to build the capital piece of it? And often the answer that we have to say is no uh, because every year it's a, it's a, it's a negotiated deal with, uh, with the city of Tulsa for Tulsa Transit's budget. Uh, with this, we no longer have to say that. Uh, so it's definitely a turn in the, it would be a turn in the right direction in terms of ha being able to know and be able to say that to those federal investors, yes, we can operate that long term. And, and I'd like to just follow up and, and reiterate, if the numbers work out in Tulsa like they do in the study mm -hmm. that, he's, that you referred to, mm -hmm. indeed, for every dollar of the 57 million, we would see a return on an investment of three to four dollars in economic development. So. A lot of times we think of public transportation as only a cost, and really public transportation is an investment in the community, and there is a real economic investment return, or economic development return as a result of that investment. But you'll receive additional federal dollars with the increased investment if this vote passes? We will, because um, it is based on ridership and population density mm -hmm. and lots of different things go into the formula and we're we're a bit of a donor state right now for both roads and for public transportation but mm -hmm. we we're actually in the state of Oklahoma paying more money uh, to the federal government than we're getting back in our public transit dollars so the more we invest on the local level and the higher level of the service we're able to provide, the more of our dollars we get to bring back home. I, um, we had some driving rain in Oklahoma today. I don't know how much Tulsa got, but it made me think that uh, I'd sure hate to be standing out at a bus stop, uncovered, uh, forgot my umbrella, holding a newspaper, uh, yay newspapers, uh, above my head. <laughs> 
Do we have need for improvement in our bus stops and will any of this money go toward those improvements? The only thing that will go for the improvements um, specifically is with the BRT and the stations. Uh, but certainly we do have a plan in place as an agency uh, on an incremental basis to continue to expand our shelters. We have about 225 shelters in the community right now and there is a plan to continue year upon year to increase the number because we are aware that it is so much nicer to wait at a shelter that is covering you, especially on a rainy day, than to, than to stand out in the elements. So uh, I've kind of opted to, to uh, use the word station uh, to refer to what's happening on the bus rapid transit um, line. So. Uh, think of those states think of those areas as as true stations just like you would see in any rail system if you went to Dallas or you went to uh, Houston and you see the light rail system these are raised platforms uh, and so when the bus arrives uh, there's level boarding um, and these are well lit well covered uh, stations so they're not um, what you normally see as like a kind of a cracker box you know um, shelter uh, it is actually a station and so uh, I always like to say that really bus rapid transit is really about, uh, mainly about actually improving the condition of the street side environment because uh, the worst part about a transit, I, I rode transit for the first three years that I came back to Tulsa every day, rode the bus back and forth to work and the worst part about the trip is always the part before the bus gets there. Once the bus is there, everything is fine. You know, you're, you know, you're, you know, you're going to get to where you need to go on time and everything is fine. But that, that wait is the worst part, in fact, a lot of research shows that uh, people's perception of time doubles during that time that they're waiting. So if you ask them how long have you been there waiting and they've only been there two minutes, they're going to tell you they've been there four minutes. Um, and so uh, that's the, and so by investing in the stations, by making those well lit, by making them secure, by, by giving the riders information about when the bus is going to next arrive, um, that uh, not only does that improve the experience for the transit rider, but it actually does a lot to improve uh, just the, uh, the the aesthetic of the street uh, makes the street a little bit more livable. Um, and so uh, even if you don't ride transit, you're going to love it because you're going to love to love the way those stations look and you're going to recognize and, and, and identify that BRT station with your city. It's going to be a reflection of your city. And so there's a, there's a big uh, piece to that that I think is what we often forget about because we as transit planners, we're thinking about moving people and moving buses and logistics and stuff like that. But, but the aesthetics is, is hugely important and, uh, and that'll be a big focus of the, of the investment uh, that goes into that. And if I can just follow up on that real quickly, real quickly, in case there's somebody out there that's still wondering what the heck is bus rapid transit, it, it is different. And one of the reasons it is rapid, it is, it is like a rail service in that it only stops at the stations, which are about a half mile apart. So if you're not stopping every block or so to pick up people, and you're only stopping at those stations, you are going to get a much more rapid ride, and you add the frequency with that, and it really is a different experience. Will it appeal to commuters? Absolutely, absolutely. Will, uh, will it be a level step on? Yes, mm -hmm. level boarding, mm -hmm. okay. just like you would have on a train. Mm -hmm. Will it have Wi-Fi? <laughs> we hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I think that'll be interesting because I think as, as LTE technology and 5G starts to roll out, you know, there may be less of a demand for that because, you know, wireless uh, has become almost something that's uh, almost commoditized now. It's becoming that way, but, yeah. but perhaps. Because you have to pay for the data. You do, right now, yeah. <laughs> right. Mm -mm. I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. We have Evie, Victor. Um, we'll start over there on the left, my left. Hi. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, if the vision uh, package is passed, will that replace funding that the city is giving now or will it add to it? That's an excellent question. <laughs> and that is one thing that we have specifically asked to be included in the ordinances that go along with uh, a tax package that these funds would not be used to supplant current funds that the city is putting into public transit. So indeed there is a net increase and no loss of funding because they're using these dollars to stop doing what they were doing before. Question over here. Uh, thanks. 
I'm an immigrant from uh, Boulder, Colorado, and we went in Boulder. We went through this kind of uh, uh, rapid transit uh, development uh, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, something like that. Uh, Boulder has always relied on smaller circular, circulators, uh, the smaller buses, I'm saying. Uh, and I've seen the circulator that's downtown, and it, it, when I've seen it, it, it has not had, uh, it hasn't been full. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I do see enough people riding it that if they were using small circulators, uh, that what we call them circulators in, in Colorado, then uh, they would be full, they wouldn't be over uh, uh, full. Is there any consideration about uh, scaling down the size, in, depending on the location, of course, but uh, scaling down the size of some of the uh, actual buses? One of the things that we definitely are going to be looking at, particularly for the downtown circulator and the midtown circulator, is what type of vehicle is needed for that. And there's broad opinions about that, I might add. I've heard all the way from um, trolleys to double-decker buses to something really different than anybody has ever seen before. I'm not sure what that looks like, but I'm sure uh, you know there, there are some... Uh, different kinds of things out there, but one of the things that we really do need to have uh, with a, a, a large discussion with the stakeholders that are involved in those decisions is what kind of vehicle is needed that will be most effective um, in the downtown and in Midtown in particular. I, I should mention that I, I know in some cities there are downtown circulator buses that run virtually empty unless there's a large convention in town or there are transients who use them and uh, appreciate them. But it is, uh, it seems to me, a question about whether circulators are cost effective. Although, of course, your circulator, at least one of them, is going all the way down to the gathering place. It's not a true just downtown circulator. Right, right. And, and I think that you're right. There's, it remains to be seen if people in the downtown area. One thing that I'm encouraged about, though, is that as we're getting so many residents in the downtown area, uh, the other thing that I think is the, the first step of the plan with the downtown circulator is to run it only during the lunch hour so that you're not running it over all hours of the day and really running up the cost. So it, we have an opportunity to test it and to see how successful it's going to be in a time of day when people are moving in and around the downtown area. Then we can see where we go from there. Other questions? Uh, back there? Oh. Yeah. Stand up. Yeah. Oh. I think we underestimate the value, the aesthetics, as well as the scientific at, at wonderful attributes of trees. And I would simply like to say I'd like us to keep in mind that at these shelters where the bus stops, mm -hmm. trees would make it so much more pleasant and more attractive for more people to ride the bus if there was a nicer environment to wait for the bus at. It's interesting that you say that because I just read a study last week that actually having trees at bus stops reduces the stress of the people waiting there and their perception of how long they've been waiting. It's a very interesting statistic I, I read, so thank you for that comment. And it cools us off. We're in Oklahoma. You're right. <laughs> Question here? Uh, uh, can, can you get the microphone? Speak no, well, Go ahead. And, I think he was back there. Uh, I have a twofold question. Uh, the first part is the $57 million. I mean, if, if you could just quickly and succinctly explain in bullet point form what that provides. So as we explain to our neighbors and family exactly what they're voting on, uh, it'd be helpful. And the second question is what if this doesn't pass? Is there a backup plan or what's the next opportunity to try to capture the same level of service? 
just real quickly, the projects again, um, and, and I don't have all the numbers on the top of my head, but I will tell you the big pieces that I do know. Um, it, maybe James has some, yeah. more, some more pieces, but the ones I know are 15, um, 15 or $12 million for the capital for the Route 66 BRT, uh, the Peoria and the Route 66 operating funding, I believe, is somewhere in the neighborhood of $1.5 million annually. 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 Um, and then the, for the transit hub, it's $14.5 million dedicated for that. And then the other funds would be for the capital and the operating for the two circulators. Uh, backup plan. Sunday service. Yeah. Oh, oh yes, and Sunday service is in there as well. And I, I do not remember off the top of my head what Sunday service is, but I will tell you that it's pretty darn cheap because you're only doing it one day a week, mm -hmm. and it is it won't be at least initially the full blown service that you would see during the week. Um, you want to talk about a backup plan? Because yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, I think that's a short talk. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I can tell you. I mean, the, the 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 thing that's the challenge, as I kind of said before, is the operating side. That is really the the principal challenge. When we we've applied many times at Incog for grants to uh, to get capital funding for transit. Um, capital funding now is kind of distributed two different ways. There's formula dollars that come from the Federal Transit Administration. Those are basically just based on how many, how much service you operate. Uh, and then the, uh, but then there's competitive grants. Well, competitive grants, if you're the Federal Transit Administration and you're making an investment into a city and you have City A and City B, uh, City A has a dedicated uh, source of operating funds, City B has not. Um, you're going to likely choose the one that has a dedicated source to operate its transit system because uh, by choosing City B, you really are running the risk that you invest in the capital assets to improve transit in a city and then it remains at a frequency that makes it inadequate. And so um, I don't know that I have a real good answer for the plan B other than uh, to, to try to uh, regroup and, and try to um, explain better why this makes such a difference for uh, this city. Um, I think uh, one of the things we're gonna see over the next uh, 20 years or so is the convergence of two generations. You have the baby boom generation and the millennials. Both of these groups comprise about half of the US population. And for different reasons, they're gonna start really needing uh, transit options. And uh, we're gonna have to really be thinking about how we keep the baby boom generation engaged in their communities and not isolated. Uh, and then the millennials are demanding it because they simply are not interested in car ownership. Um, and so we're seeing statistics that are just mind boggling that two thirds of uh, millennial or two thirds of 18 year olds had driver's licenses 20 years ago. Today only half do. Um, millennials drive 25% less than, than, uh, than their uh, baby boom counterparts. And so, there's, there's really a lot of statistical evidence that I think um, leads us to doing what we're doing. And we're, very, I mean, this is a very pragmatic approach to this. This isn't a wild-eyed scheme, you know. This is a very well-thought-out scheme of, of doing this in a very focused, surgical way um, and doing it uh, the right way and proving that this can work. And so, um, to me, uh, you know, that's, it's about uh, communicating that uh, to, to the public now uh, because I think now is the time to do it. We'll take a, the question from the guest here. Um, yes, has a design team been chosen for the construction and design for the uh, hub? Not yet. Um, if, or for the hub itself, the transit hub? No, in fact, the transit hub study has, there needs to be a study done to determine exactly the, the ideal location and the ideal elements that would be done. In terms of the design for the uh, bus rapid transit, we are, um, in fact, next week, we'll be doing the interviews on the two shortlisted firms for the design of the uh, bus rapid transit for the Peoria line. And this guest here. Uh, hi. Uh, I had a question in regard to expanded evening service. Are there going to be services available in the evening beyond what's already offered, which is the very basic nightline service? And is there any improvement at all in the headways on the non-BRT 
routes? Unfortunately, the, uh, I'll answer the second question first. We did ask for in the funding package to improve all of our routes to 30 minutes. Uh, and unfortunately, that was the part that was not funded. So we do not have a plan. Obviously, our plan is as additional funding becomes available every year, we're making some incremental changes in that. In terms of the nighttime service, again, I don't, um, that was in, in the second part of the, the package that didn't get funded. But I, so I do think that there will be, we'll see some expanded service at least on the BRT routes, which will give us some additional service beyond what we have now. But certainly there is a uh, really big need for expanded service in the evening. For those of you who don't know, we operate only six routes in the evening compared to 18 during the day. So it is a significantly smaller footprint and the, um, the frequency is, I'll just say, terrible at best. Uh, so it, we really have a long way to go in our night service in our community. Well, what other funding sources could there be beyond this current vote? that might improve that service? Um, you know, at, at this point, those are operating dollars. The, the, the things that he's talking about are pure operating dollars. And unfortunately, uh, the only difference that we could imagine other than local tax dollars would be uh, an increase in state funding. Unfortunately, right now, that's, that's not very likely. Um, but, you know, there will be some increase in federal dollars that some of which can be flexed for operating funds. Frankly, the bottom line is that transit systems all over, a all over the nation that are improving and doing transformational things for their communities are funded at the local level. They're funded by dedicated taxes for public transportation and they're making a big difference. You look at Dallas, for instance, and they have a penny sales tax. They have the largest number of light rail miles in America, but that's because they as a community have agreed that they're going to invest big time in their public transit system, and that's what makes the difference. It's the local investment. Yes, you can get a few more federal dollars, mm -hmm. good thing, Maybe if you're lucky, sometime you can get some more state dollars, but the bottom line is that transit systems that are growing and making a difference in their communities are funded at the local level. And this uh, proposal was wedded to one that would improve streets as well. So yes. uh, you could argue that that sweetened the deal for some voters as opposed yes, and, to a separate and, transit. And we're excited yes. about that too because yeah. buses run on streets too. Yeah. <laughs> So improved, improved uh, streets is, is good for us, too. Mm -hmm. Question here. Hi, I just wanted to thank everyone who is here. Um, and hearing about the street improvement is awesome. I am late because I rode my bike, it got a flat, I had to walk at home, and I had to go to a restaurant where I knew my friend was working to borrow her bike, ended up getting here. <laughs> right, so it just illustrates this whole thing. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> No, oh, but, um, you know, I'm also here because I want to be here for everyone who needs this who isn't at this meeting. Um, and what can we in this room do to truly be advocates in this, you know, election time or whatever the bond measure? Sorry that I don't know exactly it, but, um, I mean, do we send a delegation of advocates to the uh, state capitol? I mean, I, I just... What is the best way to get this actually happening? Well, uh, I mean, I can tell you that uh, as it stands right now, there's not a, um, a uh, well-organized transit advocacy group out there. Uh, and, and I think that really um, that's uh, probably something that's needed. And, and frankly, it's something that is in place in most other cities. And so um, I would encourage you to um, think about that. I mean, I think not, not, just for the sake of <laughs> not just for the sake of advocacy, but I think, you know, the reality is that um, the, uh, the, the people who use transit, and like you say, people that can't come to meetings like this uh, need a voice. Uh, and so I think um, that uh, we in the public sector try to be that voice, but uh, to the extent that we can, but, uh, but the reality is that um, 
like any other interest group, uh, there's, a, there's a need for that voice to be heard as well. Um, and so it just needs to be, I think, well organized. And I think we need to broaden the net too. We need transit advocates, bicycle advocates, and pedestrian advocates to join forces and really speak from one voice. Because I am a huge uh, pedestrian and bicycle advocate because every transit customer either got there on their feet or on a bicycle. And so it's very important that we continue to develop out our community in a way that we have great pedestrian and bicycle access. And so I think that those, those need to come together and marry and really speak from one voice. I think that would be incredible in our community. Question here. Yeah, I think James has kind of been saying a lot of what I wanted to hear, but I haven't heard the term smart growth or new urbanism or really enough about economic development. The nice thing about these BRTs is they are just like subway lines or streetcars. They're rubber tired, but those platforms aren't going to move. They're going to be pretty nice for the heat and the wet of Oklahoma. They're not going to be air conditioned. They could be someday. I mean, but the main thing is if you ride a streetcar in Portland or something, there's little digital signs, with next bus coming in 20 minutes, 10 minutes, whatever it is. You want to go get a cup of coffee, you can come back there and know it'll be there. It's, you know, informed by telemetry. It's, it's not making it up. It's, it's real-time information. And the other thing is, if anyone's ever ridden transit in big cities in the 70s, 1972, I rode the Long Island Railroad, 60-minute or more ride out to Patchogue, Long Island, a bar car, I'm not saying we need to have drinks on it, but I mean, you can read the paper, you can do whatever you want, instead of wasting your time sitting in a car on your commute, that becomes found time. And so there's a whole lot of, and 11th Street Corridor and Brookside are two of our parking lot sopping, you know, they're just excess, there's huge opportunities. Anyone that was involved with Planet Tulsa, that's the other thing we haven't mentioned. This is the implementation of that vision. And so all these things that James mentioned about mixed-use development, if I, I don't even have to, I would like to live downtown, but it's expensive. Mm -hmm. So if I can live on 11th Street or in Brookside, at 61st in Peoria. I mean, it's, that neighborhood needs improvement, but wherever. I mean, you can... Do you have a question? Well, no, I don't. This is a comment. <laughs> and uh, basically that this needs to be sold to Tulsa as economic development. I, I think that low-income people and people that are job-dependent mm -hmm. on transportation need this service. But it's more important for mm -hmm. everyone, the empty nesters, the retirement baby boomers, the, I have two kids that are 21 years old. They did not, yeah. over or over, they did not get their driver's license. One of them still doesn't have it. So, I mean, this is a new pattern of behavior, and we need mm -hmm. to reinforce it. And these are investments for the long term. Mm -hmm. So, we need to sell this as a vision. And so, I mean, yeah. and yeah, we'll get some dollars, but I think well, thank you. we promote it. Uh, that, that raises one quick question. Uh, the plans for the future call for more BRT lines. Mm -hmm. They don't call for any rail. Now, some will say it's more expensive, of course, rail, but it really grows the aesthetics along the line more, and it overcomes that sort of innate distrust of riding the bus. It's sexier. Mm -hmm. So, other than cost, why BRTs and no rail in the yeah. future? So here, here's just my view on this. Um, I think when any time you're making a, a big investment of any dollars, your own dollars, pr public dollars, you always have to think about the long-term uh, return on that investment. And I think um, for cities that invested in rail, uh, there were there were three cities that invested in rail heavily uh, in the night in the late 1960s. They were Washington D.C., Atlanta, and uh, San Francisco. There was 90-10 matching funds. Uh, they built uh, the kind of the, the modern uh, subway systems, if you will, that were not the New Yorks and the Bostons and that kind of thing. Um, those uh, kinds of systems, indeed, are very expensive to build uh, today. And so um, I think what ha the kind of the collective conscience of uh, transit planning today in 2016 is that um, it's, it's sort of a, a lighter, better, cheaper kind of a, a approach. And... Uh, it's a very pragmatic approach to that. And I agree with it because I think that, um, that when you look at the difference in cost between uh, a rail investment 
uh, and, a, and a bus rapid transit investment. We're talking 10 to 1 uh, in terms of the investment that it, it takes to do that. And uh, the return uh, is, is not 10 times more for the, for the rail investment. Uh, the, um, the other thing that I think um, that is certainly on, on my consciousness now, uh, there was a, the cover article, I don't know if anyone saw Time Magazine last week, uh, the cover article of Time Magazine was about self-driving cars, and this is truly uh, within uh, probably the next 15 years. Uh, and so that dramatically changes the economics of transportation altogether, not just transit, but obviously private uh, automobile transportation as well. And so we have to be thinking about that when we make transit investments, because we have to be able to know that those investments with the changes in technology and, uh, and the changes in demographics are going to be able to keep up, keep pace with, uh, with their promises. And so I think, I mean, my view is, as, as you as we learn more about what's, what's really happening in the world of self-driving autonomous vehicles, uh, there's also benefit to that in transit, though. Uh, the reality is that I think it, there, there will become a day where there are self-driving buses. And so uh, it, it, what that does is it puts downward pressure on the cost of transportation across the board, both for uh, for driving, because now cars can be shared and they don't have to necessarily be uh, owned and parked 95% of the time, but it also uh, puts downward pressure on the cost of transit because around 75% of the cost of transit is the driver. Um, and so um, so it, it suddenly makes, uh, the uh, across the board, the economics of transportation become much, much less expensive. And so uh, I think as a, as a community, um, what we've learned uh, with, our, with the fast forward study we did five years ago is that um, is that we need, to, we need to prove ourselves. We need to prove that this can work with, with bus rapid transit before we uh, try to get in anything else uh, more uh, expensive than that. And I know that's a different approach than Oklahoma City has taken, and I think it'll be fascinating to see the, the difference in uh, kind of approaches to that over time. Question in the back. Yeah. Um, first, uh, will the bus lines, when the bus rapid transit is implemented, will it replace the existing lines on those routes? And second, um, just sort of a comment, it seems like the advantage of a bus rapid transit is if that route becomes unpopular, it's a lot easier to move it than a train line. So just thought I'd put that out there. I, I think you're right about the, the second comment. It, it does give some flexibility uh, if you need to move. In terms of your first question, um, we do believe that there will continue to be some local service on the BRT lines. <clears throat> there are some people because of uh, disability or age or other issues will not be able to walk the distance to the stations. They'll be about every half mile. And so there may be people that are not able to get up to one of those stations and we certainly want to continue to be accessible to them. I do believe that you'll see much less frequency than we have today. For instance, the 105 route on Peoria today is every 30 minutes. I would not expect it to be that frequent once the BRT is up and running because you'll have fewer people riding it. They also see, they also find when they take that approach in other communities that they provide the local service because everyone says, gosh, we need the local service. And then they find really quickly that because the BRT is so convenient, with the high frequency service that almost nobody rides the local service. But, but I do think it's important to start at that level and make sure that we are providing the services that people need. There's a question in the back. She's raised her hand a few times in the very back row. Hi. Shelly Academy with Workforce Tulsa. So one of the biggest issues to people getting to jobs is transportation. I'm sure that the panel knows that. Uh, I'm excited about the BRT because I know that you, part of the reason you chose it was because of proximity to jobs, so thank you for that. I'm curious what you see in other cities the size of Tulsa in terms of getting people to second and third manufacturing shifts, retail, hospitality, and if there's uh, any kind of future plans for getting people out to the port or the North Tulsa Industrial Park or the suburbs. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, uh, uh, when obviously, so you know, the, the van pools is one of the ways that we've attempted to try to address uh, third, second, third shifts and uh, and uh, locations that are not that don't have. A, um, I mean, of course, obviously, there's a lot of uh, density there in terms of jobs, but um, 
You know, I think that is probably a step that we, uh, we haven't gotten to yet. Of course, we, had, do we, we do have the fast forward plan, uh, which is kind of looking at addressing, you know, lots of different corridors. Um, and, uh, and that looks over the, you know, course of 30 years or so. So, um, so that is the long term kind of plan is developing out uh, more, more of these corridors uh, and, uh, and, and doing this uh, and able to, to be able to serve not just more geographic locations, but the span of service long enough that it can serve second, third shifts. Um, I don't know, as far as the port, I don't know that we've specifically, that's a, that's a great question. And I'm glad you brought it up. We'll take a couple more questions. There's uh, one right there, and then we'll take this. Thank you. Just a comment. Uh, I just want to take advantage of having somebody here who said what can be done to, to, to uh, support uh, transit efforts, bicycles, and uh, the appropriate level of funding that we need to move people around in a number of ways at Tulsa. And I just don't want to lose that thought. Pass vision on April 5th. That would be one thing. Um, the second thing is the mayor's uh, budget process is ongoing right now. It happens every year, begins in November. The departments start putting their budgets together. His budget goes to the city council by end of it. Thank you, I was going to say uh, June, but it's end of April. So every year we have opportunities as citizens to ensure that our city council and our mayor are including not just the seven million dollars that's currently in our city budget, but if workforce issues are important, if uh, bicycle lanes are important, if all of these opportunities to move people around for any number of reasons that make this a quality city, we, have, we are the advocates. It's, it's very easy to make sure our um, councilors and mayor know about it. It's uh, DIST1 at TulsaCouncil.org. It's DIST2 at Tulsa. I know councilors, if they get five emails on a subject, it's a big deal. So if we will just organize and say this is important and continue to say it's important uh, for any number of reasons that have been named by the panel, I think that's really how you can best influence this. I just want to say that. Thank you. And uh, another question? I've got a quick follow-up for Ms. Ruggles. Uh, you said next week you'll be interviewing for the shortlist for the Peoria line. Mm -hmm. Which firms are on that shortlist, if you don't mind? AECOM and um, HNTB. HNTB are the two firms. AECOM and HNTB are the two firms that are being interviewed. And I'll break my rule. One last question behind you. She hasn't had a chance to ask a question. Um, a very quick yes no, followed by uh, a larger question. The studies that you mentioned that. Uh, young individuals aren't driving as much as anymore and um, they're willing you know to give up that second car are those oklahoma studies specifically uh well no the the studies that i ta talked about those are both those are both national studies so they're looking at millennials over the course of the last 20 years yes because I, I just really didn't see people in oklahoma giving up their cars any more than they give up their guns <laughs> so it was, it was kind of hard to wrap my mind around that the the population that I've worked with for the last seven or eight years are your transit dependent. Mm -hmm. And when you ask the question for whom or what population is public transportation really most intended for, or you know, for what purpose would a city have public transportation, I think we would all agree it's not for the choice riders who have a car, it's for those who are transit dependent so that they can make a living and our city is close to 25 percent poverty rate so the folks i work with live there and when my mom not my mother but a woman i serve can't get two miles away um it takes her 80 minutes to go to the clinic two miles away or can't go two and a half miles to her job because of the 30 minute thing my question is why would you all devote so much time and money for the commuter circular routes around Utica Square or Brookside when we could expand the second, third shift programs, when we could expand the night things, and we could really focus on that impoverished 
transit dependent population, why the focus on luxury novelty things for the choice rider? I'm concerned. Well, yeah, it yeah. goes to that balance question. Yeah, no, that's a, no, that's a really, and it's something that we struggle with a lot as transportation planners because, um, so I guess I'll start by saying, you know, the, the two bus rapid transit corridors that we've selected connect some of the most impoverished parts of our city to one in, one in five jobs w within the city. So, so those two corridors together are connecting a tremendous number of people who need transit to, uh, to those jobs. So I think that's the first, you know, that's the first part of, the, of, of that. The other thing, though, is that I think it has to be a, a quality enough service that everyone, like I mentioned earlier, that the stations are the heart of, of bus rapid transit. Yes, the frequency, yes, the, the great buses and that kind of thing. But I think that we have taken the, the long-term approach to building support for transit because for a long time I watched, you know, as uh, budget, we talked about the budget cycles, and there would be a lot of um, advocacy for transit from the perspective of um, those who most need it. And, and it was somewhat effective, but it really didn't move the needle uh, that much in terms of the public, the public opinion of transit. And so I think... The, what, we've, what we found is that really to move that needle of public opinion, we have to create something that does help the transit, the transit dependent population, and that's why Peoria with you know, one in five jobs around the, the corridor and, 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 and really two areas, uh, particularly of the city, that have a tremendous number of disadvantaged people. Um, but doing that in a way that's visible enough to the, to the rest of the public that do have the ability to have, to have the cars, they can see the value in it too. And I think that's, that is the tricky balance that we're trying to take there with that and try to, um, and try to build that long-term trust and public support uh, by having corridors that work. Um, we're not spending, I mean, not to, I mean, we're not spending $130 million on a downtown circulator. I mean, you know, some cities are doing that and with downtown streetcars. Um, we're not doing that. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, the, the circulator we're talking about is a very modest investment, relatively speaking, to the rest of the system. And, and I'll just follow up and say I've been in the public transit industry for 36 years. And I do it because I care deeply about the population that you're talking about. But I believe firmly that if we do not make it better for everyone, we will not be able to make it better for that population of people. The opportunity to build out a system that appeals to people in this community will give us an opportunity to make it better for the clientele that you're serving and that I care desperately about. Uh, a hand of applause for our guests this evening. Thank you.